Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. This is flight lesson number six in our instrument training series. This video will be part one in a three-part series taking an in-depth look at using instrument landing systems or ILS approaches. In this video we'll take a look at the ILS approach, discuss its components, how they work, and how to use them. In the videos that follow we'll take a short IFR flight to demonstrate how to navigate onto and fly the approach first with the G1000 equipped Cessna 172, then with the Cessna 172 Classic or Steam Gauge panel. Before we start this video, I'll mention that it's very important to be familiar with the basics of instrument flying as well as having a fundamental grasp on the basics of how instrument approaches work and how to read instrument approach charts. It's also a good idea to be familiar with the basics of VOR and NDB navigation as well as knowing how to use DME. It's also not a bad idea to know how an HSI and a flight director work if you're using those to shoot the approach, and a working knowledge of how to use the GNS 530 and 430 or G1000 is also helpful if you're going to fly using those systems. We won't be using the GPS functions on those units to shoot the approaches, but we will be using some of their other features. I'll leave links to all those videos, plus a link to the entire instrument training series in this video's description. So what is an ILS? An ILS, or Instrument Landing System, is an instrument approach system that uses ground-based radio navigation aids to provide lateral or left and right guidance, as well as vertical or up and down guidance to a runway. Since it provides both types of guidance to the runway using ground-based equipment, it's considered to be a precision approach. It's probably the most commonly used type of precision approach in the world and is the most common type of instrument approach used at commercial airports. There are three different categories of ILS approaches, Category 1, Category 2, and Category 3, often abbreviated CAT1, CAT2, and CAT3. Both CAT2 and CAT3 approaches require special equipment, training, and certification to be able to fly them in the real world, with CAT3 instrument approaches usually being flown with auto land or a heads-up guidance system, and CAT2 usually requiring at least a flight director and some redundant instruments. So these are typically only flown by airliners and advanced business and military aircraft in the real world. CAT-1 approaches are available for any instrument rated pilot to fly and are pretty much the only type of ILS approach that light aircraft can fly, so that will be the focus of this video. While each ILS approach is unique to the runway it serves and minimums can vary, most CAT-1 ILS approaches have minimums of around a ceiling of 200 feet height above touchdown zone elevation and a visibility of one half statute mile or 2400 runway visual range or RVR. There are some ILS approaches that have visibility minimums of 1800 RVR and usually to fly these approaches you either need an advanced approach lighting system available such as an ALSAF 2 type system which is the big approach lighting system with the red lights on the side or the aircraft needs to have an autopilot flight director or heads up device uh, available and that is used to the decision altitude. And since the Cessna 172 Classic has an autopilot and the G1000 edition has uh, both an autopilot and a flight director, these are minimums that GA aircraft such as the Cessna 172 can use if they're so equipped with those systems. And again, some ILS approaches may have higher minimums due to terrain or other local factors. The ground-based components of an ILS include a localizer, a glide slope, and an approach lighting system, or ALS. Some systems still have marker beacons, and some will have compass locators. Let's take a look at these components in depth. The localizer is a system that gives you lateral guidance to the runway. You can think of it as being like a VOR, but instead of putting out 360 radials, it puts out only one course, and it's pointed straight down the runway it serves. In addition to having only one course, it's also more precise than a VOR. Whereas a VOR will go full-scale deflection on the CDI needle when you're 10 degrees or more off course, a localizer needle will go full-scale deflection when you're only about 2.5 degrees off course, so it's roughly four times more sensitive or more accurate than a VOR. 
the width of a localizer course can actually be between 3 and 6 degrees side to side depending on the length of the runway it serves. Like a VOR radial, the chorus gets narrower as you approach the transmitter and it will be calibrated so that the chorus is 700 feet wide side to side or 350 feet each side of the center of the chorus at the runway threshold. Localizers transmit on frequencies between 108 and 112 megahertz, which is the same as the lower end of the VOR frequency range. Because of this, frequencies with odd tenth decimal places like 108.1, 108.15, 108.3, and so on are reserved for localizer transmitters. Localizers also broadcast an ID signal like VORs that you can use to make sure you have the right station tuned in. All localizer identifiers will be four letters and start with the letter I. Like VORs, localizers can also be equipped with distance measuring equipment or DME. We can tell if a localizer is so equipped if the nav data box for it has a channel frequency on FAA charts. You also want to check the procedure title and notes for any ILS you fly to see if DME is required for that approach. The range on a standard localizer is 10 nautical miles if you are within 35 degrees of the approach course and 18 nautical miles if you are within 10 degrees of the approach course. There are, however, localizers that have more powerful transmitters and are certified to a greater range. And you can tell that they're certified to a greater range if they are depicted to be able to be used uh, out beyond the standard range. For example, if we look at the ILS, uh, to runway 27 center in Chicago uh, at O'Hare Airport, you'll notice that this one is certified to be used all the way out to 28 uh, nautical miles and probably just a little bit beyond that uh, to intercept prior to this fix. So almost 30 nautical miles that you can receive that ILS uh, transmitter. Localizer antennas are located beyond the opposite end of the runway they serve, and they look like a row of orange boxes kind of with spikes coming out of them. For example, we are sitting at the end of the departure end of runway 8, uh, 8 right in Miami here, and we see a localizer antenna down here. This is what they look like. But this is actually the localizer antenna for runway 26 left, so it's for the opposite direction runway. It's worth noting that the localizer antennas are not depicted on any default airports in Microsoft Flight Simulator. You generally need third-party content to be able to see them, although sometimes you'll kind of see the uh, satellite shadows. Uh, where the localizer antennas are lo lo located in real life, they just won't be depicted as an actual structure. So let's take a look at some of the localizer information that we can find on an ILS uh, chart. First of all, I want to mention that uh, it's important to remember that anytime you're looking at an ILS chart, you're actually looking at two different charts. You're looking at an approach chart for the ILS, and you're looking at an approach chart for the localizer only approach without the glide slope. Uh, so some of the depictions that are on here will be only for the ILS, and some of the things that are on this chart will be only for the localizer approach. Uh, the localizer information is located on several different areas on the chart. It's located on the top left corner uh, of the briefing strip here. You can see it tells us it is a localizer DME, so we know that it has DME. It gives us the four-letter identifier for the nav aid. It tells us the frequency, and it also lists that there is a channel here. This is, again, for military users, and we can't do anything with this as civilian users, uh, but it does tell us, again, that it has DME. It does give us the approach course uh, in the box right next to us. So the inbound course on this localizer is 356. And then down on the main approach chart, uh, it has the localizer uh, in a bolded box. This is because this is the primary nav aid associated with this approach. Uh, it tells us that it is a localizer. Localizers will be identified like this. You'll notice it doesn't have that identifier on any of the VOR boxes that are uh, on the chart here. It gives us the frequency again. It gives us the identifier again, and then it spells out the identifier in Morse code. If you're flying an older aircraft that won't identify it for you digitally, you'll have to tune up the radio 
video and listen to the Morse code to make sure that you're not listening to the wrong transmitter. And we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but in some at some airports, they have a uh, a localizer that goes you know one direction on a runway and a localizer that goes the other direction on a runway and uh, usually only one of those is active at a time and the tower uh, will flip a switch to uh, determine which one is the active one uh, and usually they have different identifiers uh, so a lot of times you can uh, turn on the radio and either look at the digital ID or listen to the Morse code. And in the real world, if they had the wrong one turned on, you would hear the wrong identifier. I have actually had that happen to me a few times where I've started in on the approach, listened to the ID and said, oh, hey, that's the wrong ID, called approach control up and said, I'm not getting the correct identifier on there. Uh, and they called the tower and said, yep, sorry, they had the wrong one on. Uh, they've switched it around. You should be good to go now. Uh, and then we have the channel information uh, down here, again, tells us that it has a DME. You can see we also have several fixes that are identified on both the uh, plan view and the profile view. And you can tell that they are DME fixes from the localizer uh, because they have the four letter ID of the localizer next to the DME readout where you would identify that fix. And as we said earlier, some of these uh, markings only are applicable to the localizer only approach without the glide slope. The Maltese cross uh, identifies the final approach fix on the localizer approach, uh, which would be skinny intersection at 6.4 DME uh, from the uh, uh, localizer transmitter. Uh, we have this step down fix that it puts a little asterisk and tells you this is only applicable to the localizer. It has a visual descent point, which is only applicable to the localizer approach. And then the missed approach point that's identified on here uh, is only applicable to the localizer approach because on an ILS, our missed approach point is whenever we reach the decision altitude on the glide slope. One other thing that I'll note is you'll note that the uh, end of the runway is where the missed approach point is for the localizer, and it is 1.4 DME away from the transmitter. As we talked about when we looked at where the antenna is located, the antenna is actually at the opposite end of the runway here, transmitting this way. Uh, so if you look at the runway here, it's 7,400 feet, which is what roughly 1.4 nautical miles, which is why the DME at the end of the runway is going to be 1.4 nautical miles. And as we mentioned when we were talking about the localizer on the other chart, there are some runways where you have a localizer that uh, goes one way on the runway and a localizer that uh, serves the other end of the runway, but they're sometimes uh, on the same frequency. You can see we have a localizer for runway 17 right at uh, uh, Oklahoma Studies Will Rogers Airport, and we also have a localizer or ILS approach to the other uh, side of that runway, which is 3-5 left. And if you look at the localizer frequencies, it's 10.7 for this one, and it's also 10.7 for this one. Uh, so in real life, uh, the way this works is only one of these localizers will be active at a time, and the tower actually does have a switch up there uh, that depending on which way the winds are blowing and which way the airport uh, flow is operating, they can switch it to one or the other. So in real life, it's very important that you make an ID on the frequency to make sure that they have the right one turned on. Uh, sometimes, you know, if they were in a opposite direction flow the night before, they come in, they forget to switch the transmitter, and uh, you'll find, you know, you'll come in and hear the wrong ID as you're setting up for the approach, and you need to let approach control know so they can turn things around. In flight sim, however, uh, both of these localizers will be active uh, simultaneously. They're both always on and always transmitting. The only onboard equipment you need to navigate using a localizer is a VOR radio, basically a VOR receiver and a VOR indicator. All you need to do is dial up the frequency for that localizer, and if you're in range of that localizer, then you can use it to navigate. So we're about uh, 15 miles or so south of New Century Air Center. The identifier on that airport is Kilo X India X-ray Delta. Uh, that's the uh, approach that we're going to be using, the airport where you're going to be using for our demonstration approach. Uh, the localizer for runway 36 there is 110.9. I've got that in the standby, so I'll go ahead and pop that up into the active frequency for VOR number one 
make sure I'm in nav and not GPS and you can see there that we've got the localizer uh, being displayed there so if you look out there it looks like we're just slightly to the right of the runway and that's what our localizer display shows here so I'll go ahead I've got it in heading mode here I'll put it over to the left just a little bit and I'll go ahead and arm nav on the autopilot looks like nav is active so now it will track that localizer since there's only one course for the localizer uh, changing the OBS is not going to do anything. You can see I can roll this around all I want to and it's not going to change the way that the localizer operates. Good operating practice is to put the uh, course of the localizer, the course of the ILS, up at the top here just to remind yourself what that course is, uh, but not doing so will not affect how the localizer operates. Most electronic HSIs will automatically set the localizer course for you. The G1000 in the game will do it automatically anytime you dial a localizer that's in range. Though with some EFA systems in the real world, you do have to load the ILS approach in the GPS or FMS for it to set the course for you. If you're flying an aircraft with a mechanical HSI, which are only third-party aircraft right now, you want to rotate the OBS so that the arrow is on the inbound course. Again, this doesn't affect how the localizer indication functions, but it presents a pretty confusing picture if your course needle is way off from the course you're supposed to fly. Localizer course indications work just like VOR course indications. The line or needle running vertically down the middle is your course deviation indicator, or CDI. The circle in the center represents your aircraft. If the needle goes off to the left, the course is to the left of your aircraft, and the aircraft is to the right of course. You need to correct back to the left to get back on course. The opposite is true if the needle is off to the right. Other than only transmitting one course, the only difference between flying a localizer and a VOR is how sensitive it is. Since it's about four times more sensitive than a VOR, you need to use much smaller corrections to keep it centered, usually heading changes of no more than 10 degrees when you're far away from the transmitter and no more than about 5 degrees when you're getting close to the runway. You also want to use very small bank angles, usually only about 5 to 10 degrees to make very gradual changes in heading. Just like a VOR radial, a localizer course gets more sensitive as you get close to the station, so the corrections you use need to get smaller and smaller as you get close to the runway. A technique called bracketing is used when tracking a localizer in a crosswind. This involves finding the heading or crosswind correction angle that keeps the needle from moving regardless of whether the needle is centered. Once you find this heading, make 5 to 10 degree corrections from that heading to center the needle and stay on course. Be aware that winds may change as you descend on the glide slope and require changes to the amount of crosswind correction you require. To track the localizer with an autopilot, you typically just engage the same nav function you would use to track a VOR course, but some autopilots do have dedicated functions for tracking localizers. Now let's talk about the ILS glide slope. The glide slope provides vertical guidance to the runway and is even more precise than the localizer. With a width of 1.4 degrees from top to bottom or 0.7 degrees from the center of the slope to full scale deflection up or down. Most glide slopes are angled up from the ground at 3 degrees, though this can vary as needed for the specific runway being served and the terrain in the area. The angle of the glide slope is always published on the plan view of the chart. Below the glide slope angle is the threshold crossing height, or how far in feet you'll be above the runway when you cross the threshold on the glide slope. The range on a standard glide slope is 10 nautical miles, but just like a localizer, it may be greater if it's depicted on the chart. Uh, this is less common than with localizers. Typically, the range depicted on the chart is fairly short. You can also track the glide slope beyond its published range if you're receiving it, but you do need to be cognizant that you maintain compliance with published procedure altitudes or step-down fixes when you're doing so. For example, again, we look at the ILS uh, to runway 27 center in uh, at Chicago O'Hare. You'll notice that the 
uh, glide slope is only depicted out just a little bit beyond the uh, final approach fix, which is about seven nautical miles. Uh, but in reality, you'll probably be able, to be able to pick up this glide slope probably all the way out to about 30 nautical miles or so. And if you have been cleared for the ILS approach, it is acceptable to track down on the glide slope, but you also must still meet all of these step down fixes. Most of these procedures are design, designed nowadays so that the glide slope will keep you at or above these altitudes, these procedure altitudes, but not all of them are. And so if you elect to uh, uh, activate the glide slope or track the glide slope, uh, you just need to monitor where you are, where these fixes are, and where these step down altitudes are, and make sure that the ILS glide slope is keeping you uh, at or above these altitudes in this case. Uh, and if it is not, then you either you need to adjust your track uh, to comply with these restrictions, or if you're using the autopilot, you may need to disengage the autopilot or the glide slope tracking function and make some manual adjustments. So as far as chart symbology goes on uh, glide slopes, what we have is this uh, shaded uh, feather indicates that you have a glide slope. So you'll see this on ILSs and you'll see it also on approaches like LDAs that have a glide slope. And uh, then we have the platform altitude and then this lightning uh, bolt kind of zigzag symbol here tells you that you're going to fly the platform altitude until you intercept the glide slope and then you will track the glide slope down. And again, uh, the final approach fix on an ILS approach or any sort of approach that has a glide slope is where you intercept the glide slope. And then the missed approach point is the decision altitude. They are not geographical points. They are altitudes on the glide slope. In most, in some cases, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we do have symbology here like the Maltese cross. We have skinny intersection uh, that tells us uh, that that is the final approach fix if you're flying the localizer approach without the glide slope. Uh, and we also have this uh, altitude listed above here. And what this is is to tell us uh, at what altitude we will cross that fix on the glide slope. So in this case, we're actually going to intercept the uh, glide slope basically right at skinny intersection. So we'll be at 2,700 feet at skinny intersection, but that's not always the case. If we look at the ILS to runway four left out in Little Rock, Arkansas, you'll notice that uh, we have a 1,900 foot platform altitude. That is where we intercept the glide slope. And then we have Lasky intersection or Lasky outer marker is the final approach fix for the localizer approach. And our glide slope intercept actually occurs a little bit before uh, we get to that point. So we intercept the glide slope at 1900 feet. And then when we get to Lasky intersection, we will already have descended to 1814 feet. So it always puts that on there to tell you where you're going to cross the final approach fix for the localizer uh, when you are flying the ILS uh, approach. The glide slope antenna is usually located off to the side and within the first 1,500 feet or so of the runway it serves. It consists of a small vertical antenna and a very small building next to it, which is typically painted in the standard aviation red and white. Though just like localizer antennas, these are only usually displayed on third-party scenery in Flight Simulator. Glide slope information is transmitted on frequencies of around 330 megahertz, but they're all paired with localizer frequencies. So as long as you've dialed in the frequency for the localizer of the ILS you want to fly, you'll also automatically be receiving its glide slope. Glide slope information on a traditional VOR indicator is displayed using a horizontal line. If you have a VOR indicator that has a vertical line but no horizontal line like the one in the Robin DR400, you won't be able to get any glide slope information from it. You can still track a localizer with it, but you won't be able to fly a full ILS with this type of indicator. Glide slope indications on traditional VOR indicators are oriented like you're looking at the aircraft from behind, with the circle in the middle again representing your aircraft. If the line goes through the circle, you are on the glide slope. If the line is above the circle, then you're below the glide slope or too low. If the line is below the circle, then you're above the glide slope or too high. These types of indicators also have a flag at the side to indicate when they're not receiving a glide slope and the glide slope needle centers when the flag is displayed. Glide slope information on mechanical HSIs is typically displayed on the side of the HSI, sometimes on just one side and sometimes on both sides. With electronic flight instruments, the glide slope is typically displayed next to the altimeter rather than next to the HSI. 
This display will typically appear anytime you've tuned and are receiving a glide slope and will either display no glide slope or have the glide slope indication removed entirely if you're not receiving a glide slope. To accurately fly a glide slope, we need to know about what rate of descent we'll need to fly to be able to track it. Luckily, the FAA does have a table for that. It's called the Climb and Descent Table. Uh, you can just search for this online, look for FAA Climb and Descent Table, and uh, several of these will pop up. And then it's also available in uh, FAA Advisory Circular 120-180, which talks about uh, constant angle, uh, non-precision approaches, how to fly those. Uh, but it also has the table in the back of that. So the way we use this table is it's got our climb and descent angle, which is also our glide slope in degrees over here. Uh, you can see right here in the middle is our three degrees for a standard glide slope. And as we go over to the right, we really don't need the feet per nautical mile on descending. That's more for departing. Uh, we have several ground speeds listed. So 60, 90 knots, 120, all the way up to 360 knots if you're uh, flying your ILS approach in the Dark Star, I suppose. Uh, notice that th this is ground speed and not indicated airspeed. Uh, so you need to be aware of what your ground speed is and you need to be aware of the effect of headwind, tailwind, and true airspeed on your indicated airspeed and on your ground speed. So uh, let's assume that we're flying a three degree glide slope and we're a slower aircraft, we're flying at 60 knots. All we do is find where the 60 knots meets up with the three degree glide slope. And this tells us that we would need 300 and feet, 318 feet per minute uh, of a descent rate to stay on the glide slope once we are on the glide slope. If we're traveling in a faster aircraft, maybe a light twin, then uh, if we're doing something like 90 knots, uh, then we need about a 478 foot per minute descent to stay on a three degree glide slope. So you're probably saying, well, in the 172, we're going to be flying about 70 knots. So what we'll do is we'll average between the 60 and the 90 knots. That will give us and get us in the ballpark. If we add 60 and 90 together and divide by two, that's 75. We're going to be flying 70, so pretty close. Uh, and so if we do that math, we add 318 and 478, and then we divide by two, then we come up with a descent rate of 398 feet per minute that's needed to stay on that three degree glide slope at that ground speed. This doesn't have to be exact. Uh, usually if you're within 50 feet per minute or so, I really can't fly a vertical accuracy of more than about 50 feet per minute. So as long as you're in the ballpark with this, this sure should work out pretty well. And you may have to adjust that descent rate as you're flying the glide slope anyway. There's also a formula you can use if you want kind of a quick and dirty way to do it. Uh, or if you have a calculator handy, you can also do that. Uh, what you want to do is for a standard three degree glide slope, divide your ground speed by two and then multiply that number by 10. That's kind of the easy mental math way to do it. Or if you have a calculator handy, or it's just easier for you to do it this way, just multiply your ground speed by five. It's two different ways to do basically the same math. Uh, and it will get you kind of a rough estimation of what your uh, descent rate should be to stay on the glide slope. For example, if we have a three degree glide slope, we're flying 75 knots of ground speed. Uh, again, we divide 75 by two, that's uh, 3.75. Uh, and then you multiply that 10, that's 375, so about 375 feet per minute. And if you have a calculator handy and you take 75 and multiply it times 5, you're going to come up with the same answer. Uh, this works really good for uh, speeds like that, even speeds, like, uh, you know, 80 knots divided by 2 would be 40 times 10, it would be 400 feet per minute to keep you on uh, your glide slope, 70 would be 350, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's really easy for those types of speeds. Uh, and again, it's just a quick and dirty estimation. You can see we're coming up with a pretty close number to what we did when we used the table. Once you've determined what descent rate will track the glide slope, you want to make small adjustments to your descent rate, no more than about 100 to 200 feet per minute to correct for any deviations if you get high or low. Of course, this opens up the age-old debate of pitch versus power when, when flying an ILS glide slope. Some pilots will argue that you should control your descent rate with small changes in power and use small changes in pitch to control speed, while others argue that the opposite is true. In reality, pitch and power are closely interrelated and making a change in one will affect the other. So it's likely that you'll making, be making small changes to both simultaneously. 
it seems like the majority of pilots in the real world favor power for descent and pitch for airspeed if hand flying the approach. But it's worth noting that if you use the autopilot to fly the approach, whether in the real world or in the sim, it's going to use pitch to control the descent rate and you'll need to manage power to stay on speed. The same thing is true if you hand fly the approach using the flight director. I personally find it easier to fly an ILS in the sim using small changes in pitch to control the descent rate and adjusting power if the speed gets more than a few knots off what I want. And that may be because the sim, particularly the 172 in the sim, is pretty pitch sensitive. At the end of the day, experiment to find what works best for you and just remember that you'll likely need to make small changes to both to fly the glide slope on speed. You'll typically intercept the glide slope at the platform altitude, the last level altitude prior to intercepting the glide slope. This point is usually located between 4 and 7 miles from the runway threshold, is between 1,200 and 2,000 feet above the airport elevation, and is marked with a little zigzag line on the profile view of the approach chart. When you first start flying ILS approaches, I recommend what, using what we'll refer to as the low speed approach technique. This entails configuring the aircraft from cruise into landing configuration about three miles prior to glide slope intercept, so you're nice and stable in the landing configuration and trimmed at your approach speed prior to starting down on the glide slope. Then all you have to do is reduce power as you intercept the glide slope, making for a nice simple transition. As you gain more experience flying these approaches, it's possible to use a technique sometimes called the high-speed ILS, where you remain at cruise speed and configuration or approach speed and configuration in larger, faster aircraft, and then configure for landing and slow to your approach speed as you intercept the glide slope or just prior to glide slope interception. This takes a little more division of your attention as you're flying the approach, configuring the aircraft, and retrimming all at the same time. But it's a fairly common technique in complex aircraft and in larger, busier airports where keeping the flow of traffic moving is important. It's a good technique to learn once you're comfortable with the basic low speed technique, and it's the standard technique for large corporate flight departments and airlines that fly large and fast equipment into busy terminal areas. It's also important to compare your platform altitude to the airport or touchdown zone elevation to see how much altitude is between the two and how long your ride on the glide slope is going to be. It's more common to have 1,500 feet or more between the two, but there are approaches that have less. For example, if we look at the ILS to runway 10 in Montgomery, Alabama, the identifier there is Kilo Mike Golf Mike, uh, we can see that the platform altitude is 2,000 feet and the touchdown zone elevation is 219 feet. Doing the math on that, there's a total distance of 1,781 feet between the platform altitude and the touchdown zone elevation. So we're riding about 1,800 feet on the glide slope from the time we intercept it until the time that we land. In contrast, if we look out at uh, the ILS to runway 32 in Pittsburgh, the platform altitude is 2,500 feet and the touchdown zone elevation is 1,124 feet with the airport being slightly higher than that. Uh, so the total distance that we're gonna ride on the glide slope from the time we intercept it until the time we touch down is going to be 1,376 feet. So quite a bit less time on the glide slope. If you're using the high speed technique, you may want to configure a little early on approaches with less than 1500 feet between the glide slope intercept and the touchdown zone elevation. Most professional flight departments have what are called stabilized approach criteria that they use when flying ILS approaches. Stabilized approaches mean that by 1000 feet above the touchdown zone elevation, the aircraft must be fully configured for landing at the approach speed, on the approach course, and on the glide slope. These are good criteria to use regardless of whether you're using the low speed or high speed ILS technique, and you should consider if you need to modify your approach technique to meet these criteria if you plan to use the high speed technique on an approach with minimal altitude between glide slope intercept and the touchdown zone elevation. To track a glide slope using an autopilot or flight director, you usually need to engage the approach mode on the autopilot, which is usually a button labeled APR. 
Doing so will usually engage or arm the localizer tracking function if it's not already armed and active, and arm or engage the glide slope tracking function. With most auto flight systems, you can't track the glide slope unless the system is already tracking the localizer, though there are some systems where each can be tracked independently. Looking at other ILS components, most ILS systems used to incorporate marker beacons. With many localizers now having DME and with the proliferation of GPS systems, they've become somewhat redundant and are no longer a required component of the system, and many have been decommissioned or deactivated. But there are still some ILS systems that have them, so let's talk about what they are and how to use them. Marker beacons are low-power radio transmitters located on the ground that project their signals straight up, so an aircraft only receives the signals when flying directly over them. They produce an audible sound pattern and trigger a light signal or symbol in the aircraft to let the pilot know that they're over that beacon. There are three different types of marker beacons. The outer marker is located at the depicted glide slope intercept point. It causes a blue light or symbol with an O to illuminate and produces a sound and light pattern of continuous long tones or dashes in Morse code. The middle marker is located at the point where the Category 1 decision altitude intercepts the glide slope, which is usually about 3,500 feet from the approach end of the runway, where you would be at 200 feet above the touchdown zone elevation on the glide slope. It produces a series of alternating long and short tones or dashes and dots and activates an amber light or symbol with an M on it. These were the first marker beacons to be phased out in mass, so I couldn't find any real-world examples of it in Flight Simulator, but here's what it looks like and sounds like on Wikipedia. The inner marker is located at at the point where the Category 2 decision height intercepts the glide slope, so a point where you would be roughly 100 feet above the touchdown zone on the glide slope. It produces a continuous series of short tones or dots and illuminates a white light with a symbol or symbol with an eye on it. These are only necessary on Category 2 approaches, but all Category 2 approaches can be flown as Cat 1 approaches, so you may hear or see it if you're flying an ILS that can be flown as a Cat 2. Aircraft with traditional non-electric flight instruments typically have a marker beacon system installed if they're certified for instrument flying, either as a separate system like in the Cessna 152 or as part of the audio panel like the Steam Gauge 172. Most EFIS systems incorporate a marker beacon system into the EFIS system itself, so the symbols will display somewhere on the screens anytime they're activated. Regardless of what type of instrument system you use, you don't need to do anything to get the lights or symbols to activate. They will automatically activate any time you fly over a beacon. To hear the audio tones from the beacon, you have to have the sound for the beacon system turned on on your audio panel. You usually do this with a button on the audio control panel, usually marked MKR or something similar, that toggles the beacon audio on and off. There's also usually a control to adjust the sensitivity of the receiver between low and high. The high sensitivity setting makes the system sound and illuminate further away from the beacon, and the normal setting is the low sensitivity setting. Some of the old systems on non-EFIS aircraft also have a test function, which just illuminates the light so you can see if you have any light bulbs burned out. Marker beacons are depicted on instrument charts with oblong shaded areas on the plan view and with vertical lines on the profile view. They're usually designated with text on both views as to what type of beacon they are. For example, here is an oblong shaded area right here for the outer marker and an oblong shaded area for the inner marker. You can see up here, this is actually an initial approach fix. It's a share intersection, but it also designates it as an OM, outer marker. Uh, and then down here, it just has the letters IM next to this one telling you that this is an inner marker. And you can see there's also lines for it on the profile view as well. It says this vertical line right here is share 
also the outer marker in addition to being the intersection. You can see why uh, marker beacons have become redundant. You can also identify this with the cross radial from the Little Rock VOR or with the DME on the localizer. So there's uh, a number of ways you can identify this intersection without the marker being there. Plus, if you have a GPS, you can also know that you're at that intersection. And then you can see there's a line down here that shows where the inner marker is. So that's how the marker beacons are depicted on the chart. Another component you may find on some ILS approaches is a compass locator or locator outer marker. This is just a low-powered NDB that's co-located with an outer marker. All you do with this type of system is tune in the NDB frequency on your ADF and make sure that the ADF bearing pointer is displayed on an EFIS system. When the bearing pointer swings from the nose to the tail, you know you've passed over that locator outer marker or compass locator. As with marker beacons, this type of system is being phased out, but you will still find them on a few approaches. Their use is not required, they're just another way you can identify your position on the approach. Compass locators are depicted on charts with an NDB symbol over a marker beacon symbol and will be designated with LOM on the plan view and or the profile view. It will have a standard nav aid data box on the plan view with the ID, Morse code, and frequency. And you'll notice that compass locators have a two-letter identifier rather than the standard three-letter identifier for a normal NDB. So looking at the approach chart for the ILS to runway four left, we notice that we have an outer marker symbol and an NDB symbol uh, on top of each other here. And this is a compass locator or a locator outer marker. If we look up at the nav aid box for this NDB, it says LOM, indicating it's a locator outer marker or a compass locator. It's also an initial approach fix that you could navigate to uh, using your ADF to start the approach from. Uh, the name of the intersection is Lasky. It's Lasky NDB. The frequency is 353. Again, it has a two-letter identifier, so LI, and then it gives you the Morse code for that. And then you'll also notice on the plan view, it tells you LI locator outer marker. This is also Lasky intersection, which you could identify on your GPS. Another reason these are being phased out. Uh, and that's you know, all the information that you have on the plan view. So that's how compass locator or locator outer markers are depicted on instrument charts. The final ground-based component of an ILS is the approach lighting system, or ALS. There are all sorts of approach lighting systems for instrument approaches, and I'll do a more detailed video on those in the future. The most common type you'll see on an ILS system is the Mauser system, which is a medium intensity approach lighting system with runway alignment indicator lights or rails. It basically looks like a bunch of white lights shaped like a T with strobe lights sequenced to look like they're moving towards the runway, which is sometimes called the rabbit. There are two important things to remember about approach lights. First, if you get the approach lights in sight, but not the runway, you can descend below the decision altitude, but only to 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation until you get some part of the runway environment in sight. There is an important exception to this rule that if you have a, or if you're flying an approach to a runway that has an ALSAF 1 or ALSAF 2 type system, which are the big approach lights that have red lights towards the end of them, you can actually legally land, descend below 100 feet above your touchdown elevation and land if you get those red lights in sight, uh, as, as long as you can safely do so. And second is if the approach lights are not working and there are quite a few approach lighting systems that are missing in Microsoft Flight Simulator, then you're going to need to raise your approach minimum, specifically the visibility. The FAA has a table for this that you'll probably want to reference, although if you're using JEP charts, they actually put this right on the chart. It basically says that for a standard ILS, if the approach lights are out, you should raise your visibility minimums by one quarter mile. So add one quarter mile to your current minimums. For an ILS that has an 1800 RVR visibility minimum, you need to raise the visibility minimums to either 4000 or 4500 RVR if you don't have the approach lights. That covers all the theory behind flying an ILS approach. Now it's time to get in the air and actually fly one. 
As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I'll be producing two videos in the near future to demonstrate flying an ILS approach, one with the G1000 equipped 172 and one with the 172 Classic or steam gauge panel, so we can look at all the techniques you might want to use for flying an ILS, whether you're using a glass or steam gauge panel. I'll link to those videos in this video's description once they're out, and of course you can always find them on my channel, just look for the instrument training playlist. Of course, the best way to find them is to subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell to be alerted to new content when it's released. And while you're at it, don't forget to like the video if you've, if you've enjoyed the content. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.